Lawmakers have a plan to bring medical marijuana to Kansas, but the one thing it's not doing is smoking. Plus, an epidemic of suspended driver's licenses in the state, but not yours. So how is the problem still affecting you? And a Wichita mayoral candidate files suit over a campaign attack ad. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. Wichita mayoral candidate Brandon Whipple filed a defamation lawsuit this week against a Wichita man he says produced a campaign ad accusing him of sexual harassment. KSN's Tiffany Lane explains what's going on. We decided um, to file the lawsuit uh, really because we need to figure out who is behind this New Mexico uh, LLC. The lawsuit claims someone started an LLC in New Mexico, then hired a production company run by Matthew Colborn in Wichita to produce the commercial. The lawsuit claims some of the lines spoken by the women in the commercial were taken from a 2017 Kansas City Star newspaper article. It says none of the allegations in the article apply to Whipple. The lawsuit goes on to say the women were paid $50 each to pose as young girls who had been sexually harassed, but were told they were doing a PSA against domestic violence. The uh, actress came forward uh, and uh, reached out to an associate um, and was very upset. Uh, she was tricked and taken advantage of to uh, make this video, uh, and uh, that's, um, that, that is the lowest of dirty politics. Mayor Jeff Longwell says he has nothing to do with the commercial and has condemned the ad. We don't believe it's any of our supporters. It's uh, no one that we believe works in our campaign, nor do we believe that it's anyone that's even donated to our campaign. The Wichita Eagle has now used a business address to connect State Representative Michael Capps to the group behind that ad. And the Central County Republican Party is cutting all ties with Capps, asking him to resign from the state legislature, saying they condemn any sort of dirty campaigning. The party says any money Capps has given to the party will be donated to ICTSOS, a local charity that helps human trafficking victims. And here on the desk joining me this week to discuss this and more, we have State Representative House Minority Leader Tom, Representative Tom Sawyer, Democrat from Wichita, and State Representative Stephen Owens, Republican from Heston, and Bob Weeks from Voice of Liberty. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start actually with you, Bob. We've covered a lot of races over the years. I don't think I can think of one in Kansas that compares to this. You know, <clears throat> last year there was uh, when our United States Congressman Ron Estes was getting ready to run for election, all of a sudden a Ron M. Estes showed up to oppose him in the primary election. You know, that's a prank. It's a stunt. I didn't approve of it. I don't like it. But they weren't attacking Ron Estes' character. They were just kind of throwing a little sand in the gears. This, what has happened here, is a direct a, and a very serious and grievous attack on Brandon Whipple's character using something that's false. The stories, or the charges in the video, at least the first one, was actually made against a Republican senator, not Whipple, who is, of course, a Democrat. So I think, um, as the story said, it's really quite almost a new low, I think, at least for Wichita and Kansas. And as we look at these charges and the Republican Party of Sedgwick County pulling back from Caps, it's not the first time they've kind of tried to distance themselves from him. How unusual a move is it for the party to say we're cutting all ties? I don't think it's unusual uh, at all. I think that it's very important for the party to, you know, do what they need to do to maintain their integrity, right? Mm -hmm. R regardless of whether this is a Republican or a Democrat, uh, as Bob said, this is a new low. Uh, and if he is indeed tied to it as the evidence is beginning to appear as such, then I think it's a very smart move on their part. And we do need to be clear that at this point in his interview with the Eagle Caps denied any connection. Absolutely. They're using addresses to connect him to it at this and point. And I think that's really important that we recognize that in the courts, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? Yeah. Uh, this is the court of public opinion we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. And while we're all at liberty to make our own assumptions, um, you know, the, the, the county Republican Party has ultimately uh, chose to err on the side of caution. Yeah. What did you think when you saw it? Oh, man, that ad was so horrible. I mean, for people that know Brandon. I mean, Brandon Whipple, you know, was a father, committed to his family. I mean, he, you know, most of us, we go to Topeka, nearly all of us, we spend the week in Topeka and we come home on weekends. 
Brandon Whipple drives home every night during the week so he can yeah. spend time with his family. You know, he can you know, put his kids to bed, see them before they go to bed, uh, if it's possible, see them in the morning when they get up, so he can spend some quality time with his kids. So to do this kind of attack ad on him is really, really deplorable. And, you know, the, the, the actress they hired to do it has apologized. You know, she, she was tr tricked into it. I mean, this is just a new low, and hopefully we'll eventually figure out all the details, who did it, and, and be able to stop it. I mean, the big thing is making sure this never happens again. I mean, this is, this is crazy if this is what politics has come to, is that these kinds of ads that are totally false, and, and you can't even tell who's making the accusation because it's a, a kind of made-up uh, LLC from another state. So, oh. yeah, it, it's deplorable. Yeah, I think what surprised me the most was when this first came out and we were trying to find out who was behind the ad, and we, we got as far as New Mexico and the LLC, and I called the Secretary of State's office in New Mexico, and they're like, well, whatever's on our website is all the information we have. I'm like, an address <laughs> that goes to a company that simply sets up LLCs for other people. That's it? Yeah. That's all you have? She's like, that's all we're legally required to have. Yeah. I, and that just kind of floored me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, this actually, is, I just thought of this. You know, this isn't the first kind of bad thing in this particular election. Uh, the, uh, in the primary, there was a piece that went out just before the deadline that said it was from Amy Lyon attacking Brandon Whipple, and she didn't do it. And I don't know if we ever did figure out who, did, who, who set that out, but, but that was, so I mean, we, this, stuff has to, this stuff has to end. We've had some of the same things happen up in Harvey County recently, um, where, where a mailer was sent out and, and um, some of the claims were proven not to be the case, and then it wasn't even appropriately done with the paid for advertisement as required by the State Ethics Commission. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. I think that in politics, we get so uh, bent out of shape with each other instead of just focusing on who we are and campaigning based on your own principles and your own morals and your own voting record or your own beliefs and leave the negativity uh, somewhere else because I just don't believe that it belongs here. Bob? Well, I'm just going to say I think the evidence is a little stronger against Michael Capps than just the mailing address. There is also the registration of an internet domain name that was traced to yeah. Michael Capps' company also. So um, I think I wrote on my Facebook page, I could believe this is all a coincidence if I had time to go get a lobotomy first. But, yeah. <laughs> well, so. and the video was filmed at the building that he owns, his office mm -hmm. apparently. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of ties yeah. there. A lot of circumstantial evidence for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. was, and sometimes in the court of public opinion, that's all it takes. All right. Well, certainly not the only thing. As somebody else mentioned, lots of politics happening in Kansas this week. So we're going to move on to one of our other stories of the week. Last week, we told you about more than 213,000 Kansans with suspended driver's licenses, half of them in Sedgwick County. But even if yours isn't one of them, the problem still affects you. It all comes down to your pocketbook, as I showed in the story I filed with Cake News earlier this week. If I can't pay my bills, I can't pay my fine. Last week, we introduced you to Daniel you Lawrence. He's one of more than 213,000 suspended license holders in Kansas. About half of them right here in Wichita and Central County. And he says liar, not having a license has been a severe handicap from home life. So I can't go do simple things like run into the grocery store. I can't go and take my kids anywhere. To work. I can't take the company vehicle and leave and go do things. All of which costs you too. If you have a suspended license and you can't get insurance and you're in a wreck and you hit someone, that hurts all of us. The state representative Gail Finney estimates 50% of drivers with suspended licenses, maybe more, drive anyway. As you have mentioned before, when you're driving down the street, chances are you're going to pass by someone that has a suspended driver's license. The more uninsured accidents in a state, the more the cost of no-fault insurance goes up for everyone, while those who don't work find themselves relying on state social services to feed their families. Just an increasing cycle that seems to never end. And believe it or not, the exploding prison population is a factor in this problem, too. Finney is chair of the Commission on Criminal Justice's subcommittee on reentry. She says many former prisoners can't find jobs because they don't have a license and can't get one. So they end up back behind bars. We're trying to reduce the mass incarceration in Kansas. That has been a big concern here. And this is a story I've been working on for several months. We've had we've had several different pieces over the last couple of weeks. And the one thing that has really struck me is the number of people that have called me, uh, both drivers 
and politicians at various levels saying, I had no idea this was going on. Um, had you guys heard anything along these lines? Because I know there has been an attempt to get an amnesty law passed, a kind of a variation on the current law. I, I haven't heard specifically from people. What I have seen is throughout my work within the criminal justice system, the enormous amount of driving uh, of suspended driver's license, and being able to work with Representative Finney on that criminal justice reform commission, uh, and really be able to to have her share the data that she is finding. It really is staggering because, as she mentioned, when you really think about the hindrance that is to helping people become productive members of society, um, that that is where the biggest one of the one of the biggest effects that the changes that we can make uh, exist there yeah i actually have heard from constituents that i mean it is a big problem uh you know you can't go to work i mean i you know and most people try i mean i think representative Finney is right that half the people are more on suspend license are driving anyway i think most of them try they might get somebody mm -hmm. that will take them to work some days but maybe they can't do it every day so then no. they end up driving or they have to run to the store and get something so uh People, I mean, they don't want to break the law, but God, they got to live. You know, mm -hmm. and they, they, they don't have any choice. The other thing in Kansas that we definitely need to change, uh, even once you get all your fines paid up and you, you get a chance to get your license back, you have to wait like 60 days or 90 days. I think it was 90 it's days. 90, yeah, it's 90 days. days. Yeah, I mean, it's, that is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, we, at a minimum, we need to change that. Once you paid your fines, paid, you know, paid your debt to society, in fact, you, could, you should be able to get your license back mm -hmm. totally. Um, so, I mean, there are things we could do, and, and really, and, and I think instead of taking their license away completely, a suspended license, we ought to look at other punishments that will still allow them to be, be productive in society. Yeah. And I think it's important, if I'm reading correctly, that it's, these, it's the penalties and the fees that get added mm -hmm. on that's the problem. The basic $100 speeding ticket or whatever it is these days, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it needs to sting well. a little bit too sure. when yeah. you get caught mm -hmm. running a red light oh, yeah. or speeding yeah. or something that's dangerous. That's why we have, I think, most traffic mm -hmm. laws. But it's uh, even a parking ticket can swell into hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of dollars. So um, it's an important part of criminal justice reform, I think. But it's an important part of criminal justice as well, right? Because when you get a DUI, one of the first thing that goes is your driver's license. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So suspended driver's mm -hmm. license certainly have a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it certainly has swelled to where it has become a default in many mechanisms mm -hmm. as the penalty. And if there is a way that, that we can come together, as I expect we'll be able to, uh, we have the preliminary report due from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. And, and we've agreed um, on some basic... Uh, bipartisan approaches and topics that we want to tackle and one of those is sending some things to the legislature dealing with this. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Other cases that are going on, we've got some stuff involving Senate, well, former <laughs> <laughs> Representative Mike Pompeo, <laughs> who some people think should be running for senator, thus the slip of the tongue there, I apologize. A New Jersey senator thinks that there was something fishy about Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's recent visit to Wichita with the president's daughter. He's asking for a federal investigation. Senator Bob Menendez, a New Jersey Democrat, asked the Office of Special Counsel to investigate whether Mike Pompeo's recent visit to Wichita violated the Hatch Act. The Hatch Act limits the ability of federal officials like the Secretary of State to participate in political campaigning activities. Republicans have been urging Pompeo to run for the U.S. Senate from Kansas, and since March of 2019, he's made three trips back to the state, apparently on the State Department's bill. In his request for the investigation, Menendez highlighted an earlier opinion that found that any action that can reasonably be construed as evidence that an individual is seeking support for or undertaking an initial campaign to secure a nomination or election to office would be viewed as candidacy. Pompeo has publicly ruled out running for the U.S. Senate seat in Kansas more than once, but according to the Wall Street Journal, he also met with Charles Koch while in Kansas last week to discuss the race. And of course, Koch is sometimes known as a kingmaker because of all of his financial backing of candidates. So that raised a lot of eyebrows when he made that visit. But as we're looking at this, I mean, travel is part and parcel of the Secretary of State's job, and he has denied anything fishy. He referred to the request for an investigation as liberal leftist elite or left-wing <laughs> elitist 
politics. I think I got that right. I may not have. <laughs> Look, Mike Pompeo is one of the best of the best, in my opinion. He, he is a man that not only represented as a congressman very well the state of Kansas, now serves in a capacity as a secretary of state, does a fantastic job working with the president to solve problems all around the world. I think that, that here we are again looking for another opportunity, another low blow, another attack at a time when he's obviously, as he said, focused on other things, focused on the work of the state. So I, I think this is just uncalled for. You know, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with checking into it because it is taxpayers' money that was used for these trips. It, it does look interesting that he all of a sudden has decided to make three trips to Kansas recently when he hasn't been visiting Kansas. But having said that, as far as I can tell, these trips have been official trips. And I think you get a really hard, I mean, he's not coming here raising money or, mm -hmm. or, or well, I can tell anyway. So, I mean, I think on the surface, they look legitimate and, you know, I think, but again, in the end, it's not, it, it doesn't hurt to, to take a look at it when it's taxpayers money we're talking about. But, but it appears to me he's, his trips have been legitimate trips right. back to Kansas. And it's good to see him come back. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, and uh, I know uh, Lily Wu, uh, she interviewed him when he was here with that trip with uh, Ivanka Trump, and he told her at the time, he still has connections with Kansas. He's yeah, got sure. family and friends out here. So, yeah. you know, that's a draw. <laughs> well, it does just seem like kind of an unforced error that his opponents, either in the Republican Party, but more likely the Democratic opponent, if he does run for Senate next year, will make an issue out of that. Um, I would, if I was his advisor, I would have said, take a day off, man, and then come to Wichita mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Well, yeah. apparently you, his advisor was not you. <laughs> 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 well, Pompeo, I have a feeling we're going to see him again. It just feeling like that right now, we'll have to wait and see what happens, which is kind of the case. We've been talking about this Senate race for, what, a year now, and it's still mm -hmm. a year away? <laughs> Oh, I know. Well, and the candidates keep coming and going. I know. Both parties. So <laughs> yeah. In <laughs> major developments, right? Yeah. 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 Major developments and changes, and yeah, who knows what's next in that race? Well, we do have something of an idea of what's coming up this next session. State lawmakers are starting to turn in some of their recommendations for what they think legislators should be concentrating on. A handful of state lawmakers are recommending that their fellows amend the state constitution next year to protect abortion restrictions in Kansas. The Special Committee on Federal and State Affairs has recommended Kansas lawmakers change the state constitution to potentially outlaw abortion. This after the state Supreme Court last April ruled the Kansas Constitution protects the right to an abortion here. The next move will be up to the state legislature. If lawmakers pass the amendment, then the public would get a chance to vote on that amendment. Now, of course, we've talked about the possibility of a constitutional amendment. We've all known that that was probably coming down the pike ever since the Supreme Court ruling happened. The Casey Starr has come out in favor of, let's get it on the ballot. Let's see what the public thinks. But now it sounds like there's kind of a fight between wording. And do we make it just to protect the current restrictions, or do we make it a personhood amendment that would essentially outlaw all abortions? I think that that, that that is a question that'll have to be ironed out in the very near future. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I agree with the Kansas City Star that it does need to go to a vote <laughs> of the people. Um, I think that, it, that it's very important. Life is an incredibly important part of what myself as a Republican believe in, uh, the protection of the unborn. And I believe that this state has always uh, had been very principled in that belief and giving the voters the opportunity to vote on that to solidify Kansas uh, as a pro-life state I think is very important. I think there are there may be other states that are a little further along the path in mm -hmm. Kansas. I know that Alabama has passed a law or maybe it's an amendment I don't know uh, that bans nearly ever uh, or maybe mm -hmm. totally bans abortions. A federal judge just struck that down and that was I think part of the plan in Alabama to make a strong law that would go into the courts and work its way up and and uh, and see what happens with that. So yeah, and in Kansas it's pretty hard to have people vote on things. It takes two-thirds of mm -hmm. uh, my colleague or my friends here in the legislature in both chambers to agree to put a major on the ballot. The governor doesn't have anything to do with it except from just a, you know, a jawboning uh, approach. And then the people have to vote on it, which is a simple majority for passage or failure. 
Well, and that's kind of interesting because Kansans really don't have a simple majority when it comes to the abortion question one way or the other. Well, and I, th I think if, if there's a amendment on the ballot to ban all abortions, I, th I think that's too far. I, I, I do think most Kansans think there are times where, where um, abortion should be legal, that should be a legal option. So it interesting to see what the wording is on, on the constitutional amendment. The constitutional amendments are hard to pass. It takes yeah. two thirds of the House and Senate. So uh, this could be tricky. But I also think that it's important for people to get in touch with their representatives and their senators and to share with them their own opinions. And if they don't like the full ban, help them understand what they do. Uh, you're absolutely right. We were one vote short in the House last year of, of overriding the, uh, the governor's veto on the abortion pill reversal bill that passed. And so just having the constitutional majority in the House, uh, you're right, isn't, isn't a guarantee. Yeah. And, and You know, we've passed several restrictions over the years in Kansas on, on abortion, and, and uh, you know we've done we've done parental notification, we've done waiting periods. Um, I think some people are concerned that those those could be put in jeopardy if we don't pass something. But on the other hand, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case either. So it'll be an interesting debate, and we'll we'll see what happens. But um, uh, that's going to be I think it's going to be an issue for yeah. sure. Well, and I know when, it, when this has come up there, it's already been raised in, uh, I think in death penalty cases and some other criminal cases as well, that the way that abortion case ruling came down from the state Supreme Court, there are folks appealing, trying to apply it in other situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is very complexly worded. Um, as it seems only attorneys can do, <laughs> right? Um, you can say that. And making sure, and that's why a lot of people were calling for the constitutional amendment last session. Mm -hmm. But we said, hold on, we've got to put the brakes on this. We've got to study what is the best and most effective way to write this because really you have one good shot at it and hopefully that shot's going to be in the 2020 session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the 2020 session, going into an election year, going into a presidential election year. What does this do to the elections next year, Bob? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not running, but these guys are <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, they're probably better positioned to answer that. You know, I don't, you know next year is a presidential year, mm -hmm. so turnout is always high anyway. I mean, normally you might think a, a, a constitutional amendment might help drive voter turnout, but ter voter turnout's gonna be about the highest it gets anyway, so I don't know how much effect it really has. It may mean candidates may talk more about the abortion issue potentially, but I don't know that this is gonna have much effect on turnout because it's gonna be high regardless of whether there's a constitutional amendment on the ballot or not. Okay, some interesting points there. Well, there's one other recommendation that uh, one of the committees made this week. It involved marijuana, mm -hmm. some interesting developments there. They took a first step this week toward legalizing medical marijuana, but only in some forms. A special committee recommended the legislature look to Ohio for a guide on how to legalize medical marijuana here. There, it's legal but limited to 90-day supplies and smoking marijuana remains prohibited. The committee's recommendation goes further than Ohio, though, by also calling for a ban on vaping medical marijuana. Despite this recommendation, both law enforcement across the state and the Kansas Medical Society remain strongly opposed to any legalization of marijuana. So I know calls to the newsroom about this issue <laughs> have not slowed down in the intercession. What about calls from constituents? How, what are you guys hearing? Uh, my, you know, I hear from a lot of constituents that do want medical marijuana. I think the public is ahead of the legislature on this one. You know, Oklahoma, voters in Oklahoma and Missouri have passed medical marijuana. Uh, Colorado is recreational marijuana. But I, I think you know, doing something that helps people relieve their pain uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's particularly since we have an opioid crisis uh, in the state and across the country, you know, quite often people are in a lot of pain, they get subscribed uh, these opioids that are very addictive. You know, in a lot of cases, maybe medical marijuana would be a better way to help, help them with their pain. So I, I think it's a, something that we need to move on. I'm, and I'm hopeful that we at least will have a vibrant debate next session. You know, we haven't been able to get that issue very far in Kansas in the past, but hopefully we're getting to the point now I mean, it was good there was an interim study, and now hopefully we can move the ball down the court, and maybe we can get something done on medical marijuana. I think it's really interesting, right? Different, different dichotomies, different districts, because mm -hmm. I hear just the opposite. My constituents don't want marijuana in any way, shape, or form. 
Um, they, they see the ill effects that many other states have to deal with as it relates to homelessness, uh, crime, driving fatalities, things like that. And they just don't want to bring that here. They don't want their families to be subjected to that. Uh, I still stand by. Uh, now, I, one thing I do like about what the interim committee said, and that is, you know, if it is indeed going to pass, this idea of, of not being able to smoke it resonates mm -hmm. because I've felt that way all along. But I've also felt that if it is this uh, powerful of a drug and it is this necessary, then it still should go through the FDA process and should be still be administered by your local pharmacy and overseen by a doctor. This idea of self-administration of a drug, um, it just doesn't resonate with me or with my district. Well, I think what's curious about <clears throat> what we're considering in Kansas is not smoking it because one of the ways I think that marijuana has been recognized as helpful for sick patients is ke cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy who very often, even though there are anti-nausea medications in pill form, they like it was this way with my father, he swallowed the pill and then threw it up, so it didn't do any good. And I think uh, they tell me smoking the marijuana is an alternative way of administration that bypasses that. And I think um, another friend of ours on the show said, and it increases their appetite, and oftentimes chemotherapy patients just don't have an appetite and they lose weight. And, and so it's just curious to me that we're not thinking about allowing smoking. On the other hand, vaping, we talked about that a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the people who have gotten sick or died from vaping were vaping THC, the yeah. active marijuana, marijuana compound. Which if I read the articles right, obviously I was not at that committee hearing, so I'm relying on articles. If I read those right, that was a big reason why they included vaping in the prohibited levels, uh, because Ohio, at this point at least, allows the vaping. Yeah. I, I would like to see a lot of people smoke it because I think he, he's exactly right. That does help a lot of people. But we got to get the ball moved down the court. If this is the first step, uh, this may be the first step. But it's been very tough to even get the issue debated in Kansas. Uh, the, you know, the, the committees haven't been able to have, hold hearings. The, the chairs haven't allowed the bills to move. So hopefully we're finally going to get some movement because I do think it's an issue that a lot of Kansans uh, have concerns about. Obviously, people in my district want it. Maybe people in this district don't. But it yep. is a big issue, and it yeah. ought to be debated and discussed. And, well, I have a feeling that we had kind of a little mini example of what that debate will <laughs> yeah. look like right here. <laughs> lots of different viewpoints, sure. lots of different uh, ways of looking at it. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our conversation, Tom, Absolutely. Stephen, Bob. Thank you for being here. Yeah, We'd also pleasure. like to thank our news partners at KSN News, Cake News, and the Wichita Eagle for sharing their materials with us. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. We'd love to continue it online. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or KPTS Channel 8 on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For now, have a great week.